All right, let's get started for today. A couple of announcements. The final contest is underway. This is optional, but fun. Uh, you can get some extra credit points for your final exam by participating. This is what it looks like. You play against another team, collecting food pallets on the other side, bringing them back, at the same time defending your own side. We made a first uh, nightly ranking um, for Sunday night submissions, which is hosted on Piazza. So if you participated by Sunday night, you should be in here and we'll be posting those every day going forward because based on the daily rankings, there is some extra credit system. Um, so right now, at number one, we have Mr. Silly and his friend by Jihang Lee. At number two, Baseline Pack by Stephen Chu and Liam Lee. At number three, Agen Dumpyard by Nikhil Sharma and Sahil Upadhyay, um, and so forth. So check that out. Um, try out and see what you think uh, when you submit a bot into the... So you can submit a bot into the contest.cs188.org. Once you submit a bot, you can also choose which other bots you want to challenge. And then games will be lined up to play the bots that you choose. Any questions about final contest? Other logistics. What's left in 188? Your homework 9 is out and is due on Thursday. That's covering the first lecture on deep learning. Final contest is out, it's optional. The last time to submit is this Sunday. Then homework 10 is about to go out, probably tomorrow. It will be on the second lecture on deep learning. It will be due roughly a week after it goes out. Project 6, machine learning. We're revamping that project to incorporate uh, all the deep learning materials that we covered in last week's lectures. Um, it's almost in place, um, but it's getting close to the end of the semester. So what we're going to do is we're going to change the project's policy a little bit. And so we're going to make the project policy um, that will drop your lowest project, such that project six, if with the end of the semester too much going on, you don't have the time, you can skip it. You're not going to lose any points. To still encourage you a little bit to do it nevertheless, uh, we'll be a point of extra credit. So projects are out of 30% of your final grade. You can go up to 31. So we'll do to compute your grade. We'll take your top five projects. That will constitute 30% of your grade. And then we'll take your sixth project, whatever your sixth best project is. And that will kind of 1% towards the final grade. However much you have there, you have like 100% on, on that sixth project. You have an extra one point out of 100 on how we compute the final grade. Even if you don't have the time before the semester is over, I highly recommend you work through Project 6 because a lot of the current machine learning and AI that's used at companies relies on these ideas. Also, if you do it before the final, it can help you better process the material covered in last week's lectures. It will be a practice final um, due probably a few days before the final just to kind of Wake up call, like, if it doesn't go well in the practice final, probably you should study more to prepare for the final. And there'll be a little bit of extra credit on that. And then there'll be a final exam uh, on Thursday at 8 a.m. Um, not our choice, that's what campus chooses for us. Any questions about logistics? What's coming up lecture-wise? We have four lectures left, including today's lecture. We're done with the core material of the class. So what follows is material that we will not quiz you on in the final exam. There will also be no homework on what follows. There will be no project on what follows. But we are going to teach you about how some of the things you've already seen connect with real world applications. And we'll also teach you a little bit about where the current research is in AI. So today, it's me telling you about Robotics and how robot learning, which I think is going to be most important for robotics going forward, has been de developing over the past few years and where I think it's headed. On Thursday, it'll be your GSI, Jacob Andreas, who is one of the world's experts in natural language processing. He will tell you about how natural language processing is what the current state is and where things are headed there. Then on Tuesday next week, uh, 
uh, Anke Dragan will be teaching about her vision of where uh, human-robot interaction is headed. And then next week, Thursday, we'll do a wrap-up with um, discussing the final projects, where you can go at Berkeley to learn more about AI, and a few other kind of fun things, uh, such as I recently got a video of a student who just took the class online, worked through the materials online, and then actually built a robot that just looks just like the robot in your project three that you saw in a simulation with a little like arm dangling. So they actually build a physical version of that. We'll watch how well that thing can learn to move in the real world. And we have a few other things like that. All right, so let's get started. Robotics. Robotics is what I work on. Um, and a lot of what I do in robotics has been motivated by this video over here. So let's see what we're See if we can dim the lights a little bit up front so the videos are easier to see. More? More? How about this? No? Nothing? That should help. So what are we looking at here? This is a PR1 robot, which was built by Keenan Weyerbeck, Eric Berger, Franz van der Lohes, and Ken Salisbury. And when you see this robot do, is a lot of the chores that we wish robots would be doing for us. <laughs> but there's a catch. And the catch is that Eric Berger is actually sitting inside the harness and the motions he makes inside the harness are orchestrating everything the robot is doing. There's some push pedals that move the robot down. But for people like us who are in computer science working on artificial intelligence, this is actually really promising. So what this means is that the mechanical engineering work has been done. It's on us now to make sure we actually write the correct software so these robots do things for us in practice without Eric needing to sit in the harness and actually making this far more time consuming than doing it yourself. So then I also wonder, well, how much is it going to cost to get one of those? After Eric and Keenan built this robot in a research lab, they then shopped it around and uh, had a little garage adopt the next generation, PR2, $400,000. Um, a little expensive, but a really good robot for research. Price has been dropping. The Rethink, uh, Rethink Robotics Baxter is about $30,000, also has two arms. Um, fetch, only one arm, um, otherwise it looks a lot like a baby PR2. Um, about $80,000 for a motorized base. Bless you. And maybe in a few years there'll be yet something else that's even cheaper and about equally good. So my hunch is that there is a path towards getting good enough, cheap enough robots, especially once you start thinking about mass manufacturing these. Think of the parts. How could a robot be more expensive than a car? It can, right? Because the amount of material that goes into a robot, the number of motors and so forth, is less than what goes into a car. So it really should be cheaper once mass manufactured. Um, and even so, at small scale, these prices are pretty good. We still need to build the AI, though. How to drive the robot. And my thinking on this has been that if you want a robot to do things in our everyday environments, you have to have the robot be able to learn. Because there's so much variation in our everyday environments that there's no way you can pre-program into it an anticipation of everything that could happen. There are different ways of learning. One way to learn is apprenticeship learning, where a robot would learn from people, watching people, watching YouTube videos, things like that. Another way to learn is reinforcement learning, which we've covered in the class. It's where you learn from um, trial and error and hopefully get better over time. So I'll tell you a little bit about both of those. Apprenticeship learning. Something I actually started working on quite a few years ago for autonomous helicopter flight. So what was the challenge here? Let's say...
this is just process. You're, you're trying to control a system, so you try to find a control policy that achieves a task. Right? So let's see how we can formalize this. So there are a few challenges here. You get your helicopter, you get your remote control, and of course you want to hook a computer into that remote control. One thing you need to do is you need to track your helicopter. If you don't track it, you can't make decisions about it. So that's the first challenge. Second challenge is you need to decide on control inputs to send to the helicopter that the MVP from. Okay? So the full setup would look something like this. You have your helicopter, you have your remote control, but you want to send controls from a computer. So you hook into the back of this remote. How does this work? It turns out these remotes, at least for these advanced helicopters, have an extra port in the back. It's actually not there because people thought you would plug a computer into it. It's there because, let's say you're an amateur pilot, you learn to fly a helicopter. They're expensive, they're easy to crash. So you could then, instead of just flying your own helicopter on your own, you'd have your remote, you'd hook it in the back of the remote of somebody who's better at flying helicopters, and then they have a switch here that decides whether to let, in this case, the computer throw it out, or if you're an amateur pilot, to let the amateur pilot through, or to take back control themselves. And so that's the buddy port, that's the port the computer can also go into. And of course, you need sensor measurements from the helicopter, inertial measurement unit to measure um, angular rate, where gravity points relative to the helicopter, uh, sorry, the acceleration of the helicopter, so what it does aside from free falling and magnetic field. You can combine that to send to your uh, ground station, you also need position. Turns out you can use GPS for position in principle, but if you do these crazy things, GPS doesn't work very well. It loses block of the satellites. So instead, um, what we use in this project is cameras looking up at the helicopter. If two cameras looking at the helicopter, and you detect it in each view, you can triangulate where the helicopter is. Okay, so to track it, that's a hidden market model. So our stage is X, Y, Z, then angles, velocities, and angular rates. And these are our sensory measurements, some onboard, some offboard, and those would be our evidence variables. And then we run inference in this HMM. We have to put in a dynamics model, right? So we have some kind of helicopter dynamics model that describes how a helicopter behaves. And then we have an observation model that describes our sensory measurements, how they are a function of state. And then, then we can run a the forward algorithm to get the current state estimate for the helicopter. Okay, so how about the MVP? We now know how to track the helicopter. What are our controls? Four controls corresponding to each stick has two degrees of freedom. Okay. First control is the collective pitch angle. It's the angle of attack of the main rotor as it sweeps through the air. The steeper that angle, the more air you push down, the more you accelerate up. Okay. You can actually also make that angle negative, in which case you would accelerate down, or if you're inverted, you would be sustained inverted. Next, two controls, cyclic pitch control for roll and, and, uh, roll and uh, pitch. And so what that does is you can change the angle of attack differentially left, right, front, back. That way you push down different amounts of air left, right, front, back. That way you can control the angular rate of the helicopter around the forward axis and the sideways axis. Fourth control channel is the tail rotor. You can control the angle of attack of the tail, ro tail rotor blades. That changes the thrust. By default, you need some thrust there to counter the torque from the motor. Otherwise, the helicopter would counter spin to the blades. Um, but so you have that, but then in addition, it also allows you to control which way the helicopter is looking. So four control channels. You cannot directly control forward speed or sideways speed. If you want to go forward, you've got to nip, dip the nose down, and then your vertical thrust becomes somewhat aligned with moving forward. You might wonder why, are we also controlling the engine that's on here? Can we spin it up, spin it down? It turns out that the engine is is set up in a way that it tries to keep a constant uh, RPM. So it tries to go at 1800 RPM at all times, and so when you apply larger control inputs, the engine will need to put in more effort to keep that 1800 RPM. If you apply smaller control inputs, you'll have to do less effort. There's a little control policy that runs on the engine itself to try to keep that RPM constant. RPM is rounds, revolutions per minute. Okay? 
We have a transition model, okay, which will be somewhat noisy because it's hard to model a helicopter accurately. The dynamics is very complex. And can we solve the MVP yet? What's still missing? In the back. Um, we need evidence. Any evidence? Don't we need evidence? Don't we need the evidence variables too? So we have evidence variables, but we did, I didn't show them on this slide, but we. On this slide, we show which evidence variables we have. So we, we have them, we have the measurements, um, and we assume that the HMM will give us the good, good state estimates. So we have those, we need them and we have them. Now for this part here, do we need anything else? Over here? Beliefs. Beliefs. So one question could be, if you run this HMM, are you gonna just say, okay, the most likely state is the state that I'm going to control based on that, or I'm going to keep a distribution and you control based on the belief over states. Because that's for things like helicopters, it's a little tricky to control them based on beliefs, because they're very difficult to control. So you need to make sure that your measurements are good enough in combination with your uh, filtering algorithm that you get really good state estimates and that you don't have to keep a belief. Though in general, you might want to. What do we still need over here to get a complete MVP over there? Some kind of goal. Some kind of goal, yeah. right? We haven't specified what we're trying to achieve. So somehow we need to say, this is the reward function that we're going to use, because that is what specifies what we care about, okay? So, let's think of hovering. What could the reward be for hovering? We want to keep the helicopter in place. It's got to be something that's a function of the state variable. Think about it. What does it mean to stay in place? It means you have some target coordinates and you don't want to move away from them. Yes? Is the difference between the current state of position and the next state of position? Okay, so the state difference, that's actually what we have on the slides here. So for each coordinate, x, y, z, there's a desired x star, y star, z star, and we measure how far we are away from that. The further away, the worse. So we measure negative distance from that as our reward. The further away, the more negative the reward. Um, we might also want to keep our velocities small. Why might we want to do that? Well, you could be in place, almost in place, but jittering around a lot. And you could say that's not as good as being in place and not having this like jerking back and forth. So when you specify your reward, you're specifying what you care about. And so this encourages that the helicopter keeps as still as possible. Even if it means it's like maybe temporarily deviating a little bit, it doesn't want to jerk back, it just gives a little bit and slows its back and stays in place as well as possible. <laughs> How about the orientation? Looking at that same direction. So you might say, I want to be facing in a particular direction, so you might want to add that to it. Um, so in this case, we didn't add this. So in this case, with this reward function, it could actually be spinning around and it would be fine. It's hard to control a helicopter that's spinning around, so I actually probably wouldn't do that. But you might want to add something more specific about where you want to be facing if you care about that. So let's take a look at how this works. We set up an MVP. Then what happens underneath is a uh, policy search, which is a way to solve for a good policy. And here is the result. <laughs> Like flipping. 
We should do the first step to achieve something like that. We looked at what would the target charge be now? Can we just write it down by hand? You could try. You could say, I think I know what a flip looks like. You write something down and say the sequence of states you should go through that defines a flip. But that's hard to do because to do that well, you need to understand what a helicopter can do and cannot do so you can specify something practical, right? And so, but nevertheless, we tried this. So this, during my PhD work, we tried to carefully write down what a flip looks like. Then we used it as our reward function and found the policy that stayed as close as possible to following that trajectory. We did that in simulation. Then we took that policy deployed it on the actual helicopter and checked how well it works in the real world. So let's take a look. actually flyable trajectories. So using any one of those as a target would be a better starting point than something that we designed by hand. But we wanted to do better than just picking one of those. Because there is noise on those. The pilot's never flying exactly what they want to be flying. And so we want to do some, something better than just picking the best. Something that's better than any one of them. So we want to learn a trajectory from these demonstrations that is better than any single demonstration. The way we can model this is with a hidden Markov model. So we have a sequence here that we're trying to model, and so there's a hidden state sequence that we don't know is the target trajectory. Then there are multiple demos, which are our evidence variables of what our pilot did, and then we can use that as observations to what the real intent of the pilot might have been. So the dynamics model up there would be the helicopter dynamics model, the demos are observations, which are just direct observations of the state, but noisy observations. Of course, things aren't hooked up here yet. Why not? Because the pilot sometimes flies faster, sometimes flies slower, and so you need to figure out how to hook this up. 
Here's one way to do it. Um, let's assume we can fill this in somehow magically. Maybe you pick one of the demonstration trajectories, somehow you fill something in. Once you've done that, you can actually rely on dynamic programming algorithms called dynamic time warping or um, Needleman Wunsch. It has two different names because it's been invented twice that allow you to align pairs of sequences, find the best match. Once you've done that, you can hide that information on the top, make it the state hidden again. Now you can run inference in your HMM to recover what the intent of the pilot might have been. Of course, this depends on the alignment you just did. You bootstrapped it of an arbitrary kind of initialization. So now we can, at this point, get rid of how things were aligned, because it was somewhat arbitrary. Rerun dynamic time warping, which was invented for speech recognition, by the way. Um, realign things, then rehide the hidden state, and then rerun inference in the HMM, refill it in, we can keep doing this till this converges. Once you've done that, here's the type of result we get. So what you see here in white is the inferred trajectory by the HMM. That's our inferred pilot intent. And so that's what we would like our helicopter to fly. And the other ones are now time aligned because the dynamic time warping does that to them. My wonder is that white one really better than any of the other ones? Well, we can take a look. What you see here are a bunch of demonstrations of a double loop, and then in black dots, you see what is inferred. And so, without any knowledge about the fact that this was a double loop, the inferred intent of the pilot is actually much cleaner than the demonstrations. You might say, how did this happen over here? For example, how do we get the king at the top? Did that really happen? Actually, probably not. Probably this HMM that inferred the state of the helicopter while the pilot was flying was a little bit off there, and this is probably not, not physically possible to do this. And so beyond the fact that the pilot might make some errors along the way, it's also the case that the state estimation isn't always perfect, and so this allows you to clean up pilot error and noise as well as noise in the state estimation. Okay, so let's take a look at what we can do now. We have a target trajectory, we can find an optimal policy to track it, Off trajectory. 
And the linear time variant controllers actually are found by assuming some linearization assumptions on your helicopter dynamics. When you get pushed off course, those linearization assumptions are invalid. And so that's a problem. And so when there is wind, then you use just your sequence of linear controllers, you'll actually not succeed, or it'll be very poor performance. What you need to do then, actually, you need to use some of the tools that we've seen in this class, beyond just the linear time variant controls. What you need to do is you need to say, okay, if you get pushed off, you actually need to re-find a plan. So what this is doing while it's flying, it's re-planning with the two seconds look ahead. So it's not planning for the entire trajectory, which is about two minutes long, but it's just planning for the next two seconds. And so it runs a planning algorithm to find a sequence of controls for the next two seconds. Now, just looking two seconds ahead is not enough. Just look two seconds ahead, you actually ignore everything that's coming after, and it makes you too greedy, and you get poor performance. So what you need to do is you need to have a really good evaluation function after two seconds to make this work. The evaluation function we use is actually offline, we calculate the actual value function, the correct value function for flying this airship. For every step along the way, there's a value function that lives along the trajectory. And so we do two second look ahead planning, but capped off by the actual value function. Once you do that, you get really good plans out, and even when there is strong wind gusts, this does fine. We've flown in, I think, up to 20, 20, 30 miles an hour winds, it's fine. Um, well, wind gusts up to that speed. Uh, we've also done things where the wind really throws it off. So it's maybe it's doing some flips, some maneuvers, and actually the controller is done. It says at low my two minute trajectory, but it's way behind. It's, it's inverted, even though it's supposed to be straight up and finishing straight up, it's still inverted. And then it switches to a hover controller. So it's actually inverted, which is very far away from the hover it's supposed to be doing, but then it, because it plans two seconds ahead and has a really good value function as evaluation, it actually plans a flip on its own. So I actually was a total surprise, we didn't actually expect this to work, but it would do things like that, where it actually plans a flip on its own and brightens itself. Uh, but you do need those pieces to get it to work in, in different situations. Wind free conditions, just the sequence of linear controllers, that are very well chosen along the trajectory will do the job. Question here. So then when you learn all that and you discuss it and then you go deep into it, do you have to be able to train the hands? Okay, good question. What if you learn a, a particular maneuver, let's say a flip, and after that there is a roll, how do you transition? We recorded this as one long air show. We've also done things where we sliced it, so then we would look at things that are very similar. So one thing we did, for example, was we would record maybe five flips, and a uh, full fuel tank is about eight minutes of flight, which is probably like 60 or, or more, more like it's a lot more flips. And so we actually take five flips, we would take the middle, middle three, I believe, or maybe two middle ones, and then we would actually resequence them in, and we would have it flip indefinitely for a full fuel tank, just to check if it can keep going forever. Um, but you do want to be careful about the transition points. And so that's what we did there. Um, we've done things where we actually, we would record um, flips and we would then change the reward function to also ask it to spin its tail around, which is then called a chaos. And it then learns to do that too. So there are, if you're careful, you can actually go beyond just the specific things that were recorded. Any other questions? So that's flying. How about legged locomotion? Let's say you want this robot to walk across these rocky terrains. Um, how do you make that happen autonomously? There's two problems here. There's a low-level control problem, which is how do you move your foot in a certain location? That's actually done for a search very similar to the search we covered in 188. You can run search, find a sequence of low-level actions that gets your leg into a new, your foot into a new location. The question then becomes, where should you place your foot next? Because some locations are bad, some are good. And you can say, well, the reward function is very simple. It's how fast you get across. <coughs> say, okay, that's reasonable. The faster you get across, the better the reward. So maybe you get reward when you're on the other side, and unless you're on the other side, you get zero reward. And that's reasonable, but that's actually very hard to learn against. For a reinforcement learning algorithm, you're learning against the reward at zero everywhere, and only non-zero when you're on the other side, it's not gonna understand when it's starting to do better. 
But when it gets halfway there, it's not going to understand. When it is getting its foot stuck somewhere, it's not going to understand that that's a really bad thing to do. It's never going to get anywhere that way. And so in practice, often, the reward function is not chosen to be the simple, very simple one that says, be on the other side, but people think more carefully about what matters about how you place your feet. <coughs> Another reason to do it is that often, when you do this in simulation, first transfer to the real world. And if you do this in simulation, your simulator will never be perfect. Your simulator will not capture all the intricacies of what it means for these feet to interact with that kind of rocky environment. And so you actually encode ideas about what's good and bad about an interaction into the reward function. Because the dynamic model you use is actually not capturing it. So what will you put in there? Like, what could be some features? Um, the height differential between the feet. Um, what else could there be? Um, the slope underneath the feet. Is the center of gravity of the robot within the support triangle of the three feet that are currently on the ground? If it's not, it'll topple over. How close are you to the other side? Things like that. And so there's a bunch of features that you care about that contribute to the reward function. And the question now is, well, how do you trade those off? How do you decide how much of each feature you want in your reward? Not easy to do. We actually tried to do this by hand. We came up with a lot of weight vectors that we never succeed. We said, well, can't we just learn it? We'd say, what if we show a path across the training terrain? And then we say, we can run a friendship learning. What does that mean? What we'd do is we'd say, we want, for a given height map and a given path, we want it to be the case that the optimal thing to do is, we want the optimal thing to, do, to be what was shown, and so we want to find a reward function that explains the behavior we're seeing. And so many reward functions will not explain that behavior. A reward function that favors going along the bottom will not match well with what's shown over there. So somehow the weights in your reward function need to favor the path along the top and then that's consistent with the demonstration. We're actually with demonstrating more detail. We would, we would demonstrate individual footsteps where they should be to get across. <coughs> Once we demonstrated that, we would now have a featureized reward function. We can use that on new terrains to decide how much reward we get for every possible pose the robot could have on the new terrain. And so here's as a baseline what happens if you don't do any learning. So here the reward function is just even everywhere. Just about getting across, nothing about the train. Returning. Recording. Yes, I'm still kind of confused. 
like how does the apprenticeship for the project work? Like so we have we didn't cover the algorithm, but the idea which we covered is that every, for every choice, every choice of weights, there will be an optimal policy to get across that terrain. Right? And so the simple thing to do would be you keep guessing weights. And you see when you finally have a set of weights that corresponds to the demonstrated policy. Once you've guessed that set of weights that results in an optimal policy that's close to the demonstration, you know you've guessed a good set of weights that's representative of how we want this robot to behave. There is something more clever than just guessing going on, but effectively that's what it's doing. It's essentially winning an optimization to improve the weight factor and the reward function iteratively until it gets close to achieving the policy. So does it do a partnership on each terrain data? It's doing it, we would demonstrate on multiple terrains. So we'd have multiple terrains in which we'd demonstrate how to get across, and then it would try to find a weight factor that Magic. would explain that behavior. Uh, I have a question about uh, EKS. They keep popping up in a lot of different places. Um, They're beyond the scope of um, what we're doing with 88, because okay. they're continuous probability okay. and, and the speed probability. Um, but if you want to learn more, my lecture notes for CS287 are in a lot of detail. How, how do they relate to, do they relate to low pass filter? You could design a low pass filter and pass an EKF if you want to. I mean, an EKF is really a Bayesian filter, right? It's saying, Given my measurement model, given my dynamics model, and assuming that indeed some assumptions are true, like Gaussian assumptions and so forth, and an EKF is a, is a good approximation of running the actual filtering. It's not exact filtering, but it's close to it, right? If your model, if your dynamics is such that you say state can only change slowly, and you have observations, right, that the state that are noisy that might change more quickly than if you run a common filter on that or really just standard HMM type inference with this continuous distributions, you would get effectively a low pass filter. Right? Uh, um, absolutely. Okay. So low pass filter says you just assume a very particular dynamics, uh, a very particular observation model, and then your base filter turns into a low pass filter. Okay. Okay. The helicopter has like two degrees of freedom for each control. But a real helicopter, for real helicopter, this is a continuous uh, variable. So well, like, they are continuous variables. So the two sticks, you can move them continuously. Yeah. So uh, I was wondering how you would this would translate to the quantum we learned. For the quantum, for the quantum we learned that we are only considering the finite set of actions. So we can like take a max, but we're like, taking max over all possible actions of this. For like. Uh, for like so Q you value, because like for like Q value learning, for example, we're oh, taking the max need, over yeah, action. So you need, like you need a Q value that is a continuous function. Yeah. So like you would then need a. So how would I? So like the the models we learn, discrete probability can only deal with finite numbers of action, finite num degrees of action. Yes. Right? I mean conceptually, it's the same when it's continuous. Just the math gets a little more involved. And so the same intuitions that you have for discrete will go through on continuous. It's just that you have to do continuous math, which is a little trickier. But I mean, it's, it's isn't it because totally computers feasible. only have finite precision? No, well, no, no, no. Well, computers do have finite precision, but typically thinking of continuous things as continuous is still the right thing to do. It's just that the intuition stays the same. You can still solve an MDP. It's not just an MDP over continuous state space rather than a discrete state space. You can still run an HMM inference. It's just over continuous variables rather than over discrete variables. And so it all still works. It's just the math is slightly different. If you want to know more about the math for that, CS287 covers essentially a continuous version of, of all of this. Let's, uh, let's restart. So, any questions about what we covered before the break? Over there, yes. Could you elaborate on the learning or reward function? Okay, all right. So, let's elaborate on learning or reward function, which is also a question that came up during the break here.
So, we assume the reward function is, uh, well, I guess this should be s instead of x, but the reward function is state s is a weight vector times a feature vector computed on that state s. That's an assumption. And we assume we have a bunch of features that we think matter for the reward, but we don't know how much each of them should contribute. Now, one thing you could do is you say, well, I don't know the weight vector. What if I just guess a weight vector? I just guess, if there's 25 features, I guess 25 numbers. Now I have a guess reward function. What I then could do is I can run value iteration, policy iteration, whatever, find a good policy for that reward function, and I could execute it, and I could see what it looks like. And I could compare that with the demonstration. If it's close, then I made a good guess of the reward function, and I might want to just keep it. If it's not close, if the way you get using that guess reward function is not close to the demonstration, then the demonstrator is using a different reward function than the one you guessed. You need to re-guess. Uh, if you just guess blindly, it could take a long time. So underneath what happens is you set up an optimization problem that effectively measures distance of what you get in your execution from distance from the expert's execution. And your objective is minimizing that distance. And the variables that you optimize over are the weights in your reward function. You actually compute a gradient of that objective with respect to the weights in your reward function, then take a step in that direction and repeat. Um, the opposition problem is slightly tricky because often it's not actually um, well, it's not easy to just take gradients of this kind of objective because it's something complex where you have a reward that turns into a policy which turns into a trajectory, but it is possible to do that. And that's what's happening on the new. And then we declare a convergence once the current set of weights results in a reward function that when you compute the optimal policy, it's very close in terms of what it does to the demonstrations. Any other questions? It's not brute forcing it. So if you just guess things, you're, that'd be brute forcing it. If you actually compute the gradients, you're, you're consistently improving and you're descending on your optimization objective until you reach uh, local optimum. And that actually works pretty well. Typically for this kind of things, um, you can see how many iterations you need, how many gradient steps do you need, and 20 to 30 is often enough um, to get to a good reward function. Correct. Yeah. Right. So your weight vector is the, is the set of variables you're optimizing over, and then your gradient tells you which direction to step to change that weight vector. Then you'll compute the optimal policy for the changed weight vector. You'll see how close it is to the demonstration. There'll be a gradient calculation telling you how to get it even closer. You take a step in the gradient direction and you repeat it. Um, you might be able to pick the features automatically here using the latest tools that exist now. I haven't seen anybody do this yet. It might be possible. I think it's probably possible. Um, but this work, like when this quadruped started succeeding at this, was before um, it was well understood how to also learn the features. But we'll get a little bit to that in the next half of lecture. Yes? Yes, a good question is, what are the assumptions here? And the assumption in this experimental setup was that you get a height map. So somebody provides you with a height map of the entire train, both for training train and for test train later. So the robot does not have to sense the environment itself. It's given a perfect map, or perfect enough for this kind of robot. In fact, a lot of the current work in robotics, and we'll look at some of that soon, relates exactly to how to get onboard sensing 
to work, to learn on board sensing that allows you to do things with just a camera on board rather than needing an external map to help you. Control policy classes and pre-parameters and so forth. 
And maybe you haven't learned those parameters, but typically it's hard to get the system to learn a lot of parameters, so usually it's just a small number of parameters to get out whatever commands ultimately from this process. Why can't we just replace the whole thing with a big neural network? Think about it. If you look at this top pipeline here, what's sitting in here? Computation. It's some calculation that's happening. A neural net can also do computation. It's actually very flexible depending on what the exact weights are. It'll compute very different things. So you can imagine that for whatever you put here, there will be a neural net that can also compute the same thing. It's just now you just specify a neural net, but of course, is a question of what should the parameters be, all the weights on the connections. How can you learn those? First thing to be aware of is that we're looking at reinforced learning problems here, which is different from supervised learning. For vision and speech, those are supervised learning problems. You get an example input, corresponding output. So it's very clear what you have to do. Change the weights to get the output to match the desired output. In a reinforced learning setting, what happens is your neural net might input a Q function or a policy, then for a state, it outputs an action, then the world changes, it's a reward, new state, and this repeats. This happens in many, many places, not just in robotics. In anywhere we have sequential decision making. But it's a more difficult problem than supervised learning because it's difficult to say at every single time what the right action is to take because there's a continuum of actions being taken. So you want instead to just specify a reward function and be able to learn against that, optimize reward. Okay, so what are some of the additional challenges then? First one is stability. What do you mean with that? Let's say you make a small mistake then typically you'll land in a state you're less familiar with, which might result in again making a small mistake, in fact a slightly bigger mistake, and this will compound over time, things can spiral out of control, get a, a crash of a helicopter or something like that. Credit assignment. What's the issue here? In supervised learning, you have an input, you have your weights, which determine what output you produce, maybe a distribution over possible labels, and then there's a correct label, and that correct label directly tells you in which direction you should, you should change your weights such that you put a higher probability on the correct label. Reinforced learning. You might be taking actions for a long time and you see no reward at all. You don't get any information about whether you took the right action or the wrong action, or maybe just one that's a waste of time. Um, so that makes it a lot harder. When you compute grades in reinforcement learning, they still exist if you want to do that. We've seen it with Q learning updates and so forth, but it's all a lot noisier than what you get in supervised learning. And then you need to do exploration, because you don't know what's in the world, you need to go try new things, see if there's any good reward to be had where you haven't been yet. But still, you can ask yourself the questions. The question, can we go all the way from pixels to action? So can you take, for example, the game of Tuber, have your system look at this, but nobody extracts state for you. So unlike with the Pac-Man game that you've been working so far, where it would give you where's the goes, where are the walls, where are the food tiles, and so forth, imagine all you get is the pixels. Pixels go in here, reinforce the learner. It's supposed to take a joystick action, and this repeats. Every now and then the score goes up in the game. That's your reward function. Same for the other games. Can you learn that? To learn this, you actually need to learn a vision system and a control system. You just need to understand what's in the images, and you need to understand how to take actions in this kind of world. So you can set this up. So what we look at, what we're looking at here is a neural net that encodes a Q function. So here is the input image. Then there are um, evolutional neural net layers, which is a particular architecture of neural net that is not fully connected but has sparse connections in a clever way. Um, then we have some fully connected layers. And then instead of scoring classification uh, for cat, dog, horse, and so forth, we're scoring each possible action. In fact, we want to output the Q value for the current input image and each of the actions. So no feature design at all here. It's just this neural net has to figure it out on its own. It has to understand what vision is like and then what actions are like and what the dynamics of that world is like to really understand what the Q value should be. So what you could do is you could set this up. You can then decide to run a Q-learner. You've seen how to do that. You can run a Q-learner. It'll then have weight updates. Very similar to the weight updates you have when we did featureized Q-learning. And your neural net will adapt over time. 
question is, can you get this to work? Actually, people try this for a long time and we used to not be able to get this to work. 2013, and then the official paper came out in 2015, DeepMind, which was a company in London that's now part of Google, actually figured this out. They were able to get QLine to work for this big neural net for Atari games. And what you see here on the vertical axis is different games. So video pinball is at the top, then boxing, then breakout, and so forth. The horizontal axis is performance. So they have some human testers, some of the average scores of the human testers, and then calibrated the computer players against that. So 100%, which lives right here, that's uh, human level performance. Anything that's better than 100%, the cue learning already resulted in better than human performance. So about two thirds of the games, uh, that's what happened. It's a very surprising result. The first big result really, um, kind of wide range of environments, many different games, so many different visual environments, but a single algorithm that was able to learn to act in all of those. It learned a separate neural net for each one of them. Neural net one is trained for game one, neural net two for game two, but it's the same algorithm behind it. It was not a neat one. If you just tried it, what could go wrong? And what were the fixes they came up with? It used epsilon greedy. We know about that. Very simple exploration strategy. It couldn't be simpler than that. That's actually what they used. And then deep network is their um, Q function representation. First important idea, stabilizing Q learning. So it's very easy for Q learning to run away. Why is that? Remember the Q learning update? It's a Bellman equation that says Q value at current state of action should be equal to reward plus best Q value at the next state. And there's some expectation over that, right? That's a self-consistent set of equations. He's saying the left has to be equal to something where that same quantity appears again on the right. And if you just naively update things, it's easy for things to spiral out of control and not get anywhere and not converge at all when you use the deep neural net. You know, for tablet representations, no problem. For the deep neural net, it's easy to spiral out of control. So to stabilize this, what did they do? Instead of doing single sample updates, they did an updates based on 32 samples. Instead of having like one valid equation, you do a stochastic update for it, you take 32 of them, take 32 samples, and make all of them a little bit more satisfied than they were before. The other thing, the reason it can spiral out of control is because you do an update, and then that Q value that was just updated, Q function is updated, actually appears for the next update on the right hand side as what you use as your target. And so you have this feedback loop, this very fast feedback loop, how Q value is going to get updated and reused, next step to be target, and so forth. And so they said, as our, we have a separate target Q network. And so we have a target Q network that we use to do updates. And only every 10,000 updates can we take the Q network that we're learning and then move it into the target Q network and start using it as our new target. So there's not a set of every step I mean, new Q function as target every 10,000 of them. Another reason this 32 matters here is that they could use 32 that are not sequential. So they would collect a bunch of data and then randomly sample 32. That way you have a better distribution over samples because if you take sequential samples, they're highly correlated, and it might really push it too far in terms of overfitting that current experience. <laughs> Lots of data. It took 38 days of game experience to make this work. You make a bet here. Say, I think this is going to work. I think I can keep this running for a long time and tune hyperparameters and so forth. I might take six, seven, eight days of actually running time, because it runs faster than real time, about six, seven times faster than real time. But still, that's a long time to wait to get results. At Berkman here, actually, we're looking at something very similar where we're setting up neural nets uh, to learn locomotion control. And so we go, in this case, from growth angles, growing velocities, to torques at each of the motors. And then the question, of course, becomes how do we score every possible action? Because Q learning, you have a score for every possible action. That's difficult to do because we now have continuous action spaces. And so it's not clear how to represent that. Another thing, because Q learning has this destabilizing effect at times, it's hard to manage that and avoid that. Um, the question is, how do you ensure that you're always making progress? Actually, we start looking at a policy optimization approach. And so what you do there is you say, well, we'll have a policy type data, which is this deep neural net that's shown over here. It actually is bigger than what's shown over here, just a sketch, which goes from joint angles and joint velocities to torques at each of the motors. 
that's your pi theta, theta is the parameter vector, all the weights in the neural net, we want to maximize expected sum of rewards. For any choice of the weight vector, you can actually run the simulation, see how much reward you get. If you then change the weight vector, you can see if it's better or worse. And so it's very easy to keep track of progress and ensure that you want to be making progress in this. You can also compute gradients on this kind of objective. It's slightly trickier because there's some stochasticity in there in what happens, so it's not deterministic, so gradients have to be computed uh, through estimates. There's a little more work that goes into it, but the main idea still works. You can compute a gradient at your current parameter vector, then make an update and repeat. The thing that actually tends to work better than a gradient is a natural gradient. We won't be able to go into details, but just so you know that, uh, that that exists. Now we actually have to do more. So here is something that is kind of a high level idea that is interesting to be aware of. Let's say you have a gradient estimate here, g hat is your gradient estimate, then your first order approximation would be something like this. Of course, it tells you that you should go in the gradient direction, or the negative gradient direction if you're minimizing, but you're going effectively in the gradient direction, you should go as far as possible. He says, no, you need to step size, because if the linearization went locally bound, you need to be careful. One way indeed is to step size. Another thing you can do is to define a trust region, and that turns out to make a big difference. You can define a region in which you trust your gradient. You say, in this region around my current parameter vector, I trust the gradient. And we define that in this particular way. The details aren't super important, but the main idea is that we can quantify where we trust the gradient, where we don't. We stay in the region where we trust the gradient. Within that region, find the best spot. Actually, now we can often make much bigger steps, because if we trust the gradient, we're very far out in some regions, then we can go very far. We don't have to repeatedly compute gradients to get somewhere. Turns out we need to do even more than that, but let's first take a look at the results here with this. So what you see here is the result of learning. So this is a learned, oh, a little jittery. It doesn't actually jitter. It's the movie that's jittering. But uh, you see learned controllers. These are the output policies it found, short of the jitter. Let's see if it gets to play the second time if it might jitter less. <coughs> oh, it doesn't make a difference. So you see it actually has invented locomotion gates. And the reward function we use is very simple actually. So it's actually a very difficult reinforced learning problem. All of gets is higher reward for the further it's forward, further north, and negative reward for hitting the ground. The harder you hit the ground, the worse. So we don't tell it the walking looks like. In fact, initially you see it just fall over, the very first attempt. But over time, the weights in the neural net get better and better and better. It starts inventing uh, walking. Pro. First it invents skipping, um, and after it's invented skipping, it moves on to running. Now, when you evaluate these kind of things, what you tend to do when you're doing research is say, well, is this trust region idea really better than what people did before? You have to run other algorithms too. And then you plot learning curves. So, for example, this is for the walker. Horizontal axis is the number of policies we considered, so the number of updates we did to the weights. And vertical axis is performance. The lower is better because we work with cost, we want low cost. The blue and the green are actually the trust region method, and then the other ones are previous existing methods that are learning a lot slower than when you use this trust region. Okay? And so if you come up with yet another algorithm, what you would do is you would actually do something similar. You'd implement the baselines, you compare, you see which one learns faster. You can actually also run this on the Atari games. It's the exact same thing that we actually developed for locomotion. You can fold it onto pixel input and joystick output, and it'll learn a policy for Atari games. But we're not the first ones to do this. In fact, we were inspired by the deep mind work that was happening in 2013. Then in 2015, we just tried it out, and it works just as well with trust vision policy optimization. Um, now, if you want to do more than what I just showed you, you need to do things a little better. If you want to do 3D locomotion, for example, what I showed you was 2D, you couldn't fall out of the plane, you need to do something extra. You actually need to inspect the grade. And again, this is just to give you a flavor for what goes on in this kind of research. But this is what the gradient expression actually looks like. There's some of the rewards there. There's a value function being subtracted out. So you're kind of comparing how much reward did I get compared to what the value function predicted I would get. If I get more than I did well, if I get less than I did so well. 
But rewards are stochastic. The rewards you have to get, you can be lucky, unlucky, there's a lot of variance on that. So you get a better grade than this, and then actually what you can do is you can replace the future rewards by a Q function estimate. There's some details on how to do that, but once you do that, you get this to work a lot better. The way you estimate that Q function is through also estimating a value function, having a trust region for how you find that. So once you do that, this is the kind of result you're able to get. Initially, this thing is falling over. It's learning. It doesn't know what to do. It you know that just <laughs> randomly mapping from inputs to outputs. But over time, it's starting to invent what it takes to go as far north as possible and to hit the ground as lightly as possible, or maybe not even hit the ground at all in this case here. After 640 iterations, it manages to complete an entire episode. That's just pretty fast after 2000. Now you can use the exact same algorithm without change <laughs> and give it a different robot. Again, the reward function is the further north, the better, and impact with the ground, the less impact, the better. We use a simulator called Majoko, um, built by Emma Todorov at the University of Washington. And See that it's a great simulator, but also the robot can explore some things that you can do in simulation, but not in the real world. Uh, it can go really, really fast. Um, there it goes. Super fast locomotion. <laughs> Here the reward function is whether the head is at standing height or not. So distance from standing head height. And so then it's like, okay, sitting is better than lying, because it gets the head closer to standing head height. <laughs> Here's actually invent standing up. Okay? So this is amazing because what's happening here is that for each new problem, very little prior knowledge has to go into designing the controller. So she put forward a neural net, put forward a new simulator, and then the, in this case, generalized advantage estimation combined with trust vision policy optimization successfully optimizes this um, policy to find a really good controller for any of those tasks. And so, to contrast this, let's take a look at what happened about a year ago. So what happened a year ago? Um, a year ago, there was a huge uh, challenge, a robotics challenge. Two million dollar challenge. To get a robot to walk, uh, get out of the car, walk, turn a bottle, and then step up some stairs. Roughly. Two million dollar challenge, lots of really good teams participated. And this is the results people you could see there, I was there actually, this was east of LA, watching what was going on. Not the video I took, this is a video that's very popular on YouTube. Very hard to do, it takes a lot of data. 
Learning locomotion, the video you want, on learning locomotion, it will take him two weeks in real time. Again, two weeks to learn a little bit of locomotion at home, not a problem, of course, but two weeks to see something fail and then see what was still wrong with it and update your network parameters and hyperparameters and so forth, that's a long time. That's difficult to get to work. So, supervised learning, of course, is much better understood. Vector optimization, which is kind of what we did with the helicopter, is very well understood too. And the question is, can we combine vector optimization and supervised learning to get something that learns a general neural net policy? Let's say you find some trajectories that are good, so you then train a neural net in a supervised way to match those trajectories and then have it generalized to new situations. That's guided policy search. Some trickiness to be aware of is this looks good, but then if you just do this, there actually some things that will go wrong. Issue with good trajectories only is that you only see good stuff. And whenever there's some noise, something that's not exactly the way it was in the training data, you want to see what to do. So you actually need to do some noise into your demonstrations or in your trajectory <laughs> optimized for instance that you find an issue. Another issue with the two-phase pipeline is it could be a mismatch. It could be that the neural net cannot capture the trajectories you have. For example, the neural net only has access to pixels in the camera, and based on that it has to make decisions. But the trajectories you optimize were optimized with access to all information about the environment. And so now it might be that the trajectory is such that you cannot see enough information in your pixels because you're blocking your own view, and so you can never learn to do the right thing. And so you need to worry about the potential mismatch between the two. You need to optimize at the same time. So you actually can set up an optimization problem that says, I'm going to optimize some trajectory specific policies, pi i, where i indexes over trajectories, and then make my neural net agree with that. Here's what the learning looks like. This is slightly sped up, 20x, where you see the robot learning to place the block into that corner. It is all running trajectory optimization to learn a controller to succeed at that particular task, but it's a very specific task, and it takes about 10 minutes to solve one very specific task. This number of samples is collect roughly this many. This for a wide range of tasks. Now, then you can take a neural net and say, now that it learned to bolt things on, can I have it match that going from pixels all the way to motor torques? And so some tasks we looked at are insertion, hanging, um, putting a claw of a hammer underneath the nail, and screwing cap into the ball. Here's the learning in action. So what you see happening here is you see multiple target locations. For each target location, it's running a separate reinforcement learner to get really good at that particular target location. Because it's holding with its left hand, it knows where that is. It has a lot of information for that reinforcement learner to exploit. But then in parallel to these about 10 reinforcement learners that are learning for a specific target location, there's a big neural net being trained that doesn't know where the left hand is, that only gets to see camera pixels and still has to match the torques that are applied to the right arm. And so it learns a neural net that maps from image to torques. Here are the learned skills. So what you see here is test time, neural net being executed, a new situation where some user's there, but it doesn't get distracted by them. But here, test time, it has to find that opening, find a way to insert, putting the claw of the hammer underneath the nail. That should hold the hammer differently here. So the visual system realized, I need to pay attention to both where the nail is and how the hammer is being held. If I need those two pieces of information, then be able to send the right motor torques to the motors. I think we're about out of time, so I should let, let's stop here.